So we're talking about prayer, fasting, and meditation. You know, all as we are all the followers of Christ, those are things that we have to be practicing. God has given us certain tools to help us grow, to overcome and draw near to Him. And how we use these tools will determine how God can use us in His work now and in His kingdom in the world to come. Now these tools are, as you all well know, Bible study, prayer, fasting and meditation. Now let us see today how we should use personal prayer, fasting and meditation to this end. First of all, prayer, brethren. The question is, should we pray? I think that, you know, that's a question that we all would respond to, yes, of course. Now, having said that, we need to keep in mind that God Almighty is the source of everything. Now, everything we really want and need comes from God. Yes, we know that theoretically indeed. But we tend to forget this vital fact in our modern, science-oriented, mechanical, intellectual vein society. We think in terms of you know, happenstance, influencing men, wheeling and dealing and working the angles about 95% of the time, and then we look to God only as a kind of last resort when we are really desperate. Now, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the average member of the Church of God. But God is a source of power, knowledge, progress, advancement, organization, happiness, everything we really want. In James chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, let's see verse 17. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So basically the only source to go to, to solve problems is God. If we have needs, brethren, whether spiritual or physical, God is the source of every good gift, as it says in James 1. He is the source of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. If you take a look at verse, in verse, verse 5 in James, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This is a promise. You know, in uh, Proverbs also as a parallel scripture, Proverbs 3 verse 6 is, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths in all your ways. Even in those that we might think that they're just marginal and unimportant, brethren, God is intimately, he wants to be involved in our lives. We have to keep that in mind. He is the source of peace. Remember the prayer of Jesus Christ, the last prayer, John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So, you know, God is, you know, the source of peace, the source of power, love. And also, he is the source of a sound mind. Remember, first thing, uh, second thing that is, verse one, uh, chapter 1 and verse 7. So, Second Timothy, chapter 1, verse 7, speaks about what God is, that He has given us, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God, you know, is also the source of promotion and advancement, not men. He is our protector. He heals us and forgives us. He is, you know, the source of promotion and advancement. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. Psalm 75, verse 6. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. When I mention that he is our protector, you might be reminded, brethren, of Psalm 91. If you remember Psalm 91, we had a, a, a Sabbath sermon a Sabbath message on Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is actually the place of safety psalm. So it's, you know, it, it uh, teems with promises of supernatural protection in the time of trouble. But also, of course, that same principle does apply to us even now, before the coming of the Great Tribulation. And speaking of the place of safety, of course, there are plenty of other references in the Old Testament that we still have to cover. I haven't forgotten that. 
It's just that, you know, I want to have a variety of topics that we need. God heals and forgives us in Psalm 103 and verse 3. It says that he is who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And, you know, when our ways please him, God grants us favor even with those who hate us. You might remember Proverbs 16 and verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, God's promise in Proverbs 6 and 3, that if we seek his help and guide us in everything we do, he'll make even our thoughts a reality. Proverbs 6 verse 3. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself, for you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself, plead with your friend. Now, brethren, do we believe this? You know, we are one of a select few who can talk to God at this time and have, you know, we have the access to his throne through Jesus Christ. So we are one of these, you know, select few who can talk to and be helped by the God creator of all that exists. Now realize as we go to God that, you know, we are actually going to the source and the fountain head of all things. And also that he's able to bring about what we want and need. So our Father has that power, you know, to make it right no matter what our problems and set us free from guilt, trouble, sickness, trials. Now, secondly, we have to keep in mind when it comes to our prayer life that we cannot receive anything. Or better said, we can receive nothing except from God. In John 3, verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So, brethren, once God calls and begins to work with us, we can receive nothing apart from him. Now, realizing this, we should seek God in prayer desperately, urgently, as a thirsty man in a desert seeks water. Let's see in that context, Psalm 63. So we need to, you know, desperately be seeking God and in prayer, of course. Psalm 63, verse 1. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus, I'll bless you while I live. I'll lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice so this was the this was the excerpt from psalm 63 verse 1 through 8 now without god's direction brethren without his guidance favor power and help we can accomplish nothing worthwhile or of lasting value in john 15 again the last prayer of jesus christ this time verse 5 john 15 5 he said i'm the one and you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. So what we do ultimately accomplish or the spiritual progress we make or fail to make is in direct proportion to our realization of this fact. Keep in mind also Psalm 121 and verse 1. So the first verse in Psalm 127 that is. So Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the labor in vain who build it, Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Then the third point, keeping in mind, of course, our prayer life, is something that God requires of us, brethren. He requires that we ask. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock. And it will be opened to you, for everyone 
who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is actually from Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. So, brethren, God requires that we ask and that we seek that which we need in order for us to draw near to Him in a close, personal, father-son relationship. He wants us to learn to trust, rely, and look to Him as the source of everything. Please go to Luke 18, a well-known parable to you and me but we will just rehearse it and be reminded of it because we're speaking about the fact that God requires us to ask him in prayer so in addition God wants us to learn to persevere in prayer and boy oh boy when I have said that I will, I'm wondering how impatient I am myself and you know shall I guess brethren that many of you or all of you have exactly the same problem we need to persevere in prayer. Sometimes we just feel desperate that the answer is not coming or hasn't come yet. And we just, we just feel so desperate and impatient. The parable of the unjust judge shows us this principle, perseverance in prayer. Luke 18 verse 1, then he spoke a parable to them. So this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He's speaking this to us as well, brethren, today. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying... There was a certain, in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I'll avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Verse 6. Then the Lord said, So this is the same Jesus Christ, the same Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, who is telling us, brethren, he said here what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, by praying faithfully and steadfastly, about problems or needs until God definitely answers one way or another, we build perseverance into our character. <laughs> I guess perseverance and patience, brethren, at least in my case, building that one seems to be the most tedious task of all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter, verse 58 tells us, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, brethren, keep that in mind. It doesn't matter how little our numbers are. The number We're not into numbers. The Church of God is never into numbers. The, the moment we start worrying about numbers, brethren, that moment we start slacking and being discouraged, and that moment we are just being on the wrong track. It's not about the numbers. It has never been about the numbers. So we should never be discouraged about how little flock we are. You know, be not afraid, little flock, for it was God's Father. Remember, the motto of the feast is the will of your Father to give you the kingdom. So we are to, you know, we are to know that our labor in any moment is not in vain. Oh yes, I understand. We have been abused by various powers. We have been deserted by those who are supposed to lead us. We have been left to fend by ourselves, by those who are supposed to shepherd us, but brethren, even that, all that is not in vain. All that builds certain types of character, and whatever we have done in the last how many years we have been called by God and being in the church and all the turbulences that we have survived, brethren, it's not in vain in the Lord. Nothing of that is in vain. Because this is what it says in Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. That we are, you know, we have remained steadfast, immovable. Oh yes, we failed, of course, we are not perfect, but we still remain steadfast in the truth. We still wanted to be a Philadelphia remnant. We wanted to be congregated and have this kind of brotherly love that we yearned for for years and years. 
and we have remained steadfast, immovable, and still abounding in the work of the Lord. And all that labor that we have performed so far, brethren, is not in vain. No, not at all. Then the question comes, when should we pray? When should we pray? Well, there is nothing permanent about a spiritual mind in a physical body. I'm sure that some of us who are of the age certainly do understand that much better. When we are younger, you know, we think that the whole world is in front of us and that we have a whole eternity in front of us. But now we understand that that's not the case. And as time keeps progressing, we understand that there is nothing permanent about a spiritual mind in a physical body. And therefore, we must renew God's Spirit in us daily. In Second Corinthians verse 16 uh, of chapter 4 second Corinthians 4 16 it says therefore we do not lose heart again the same theme as we read in first corinthians we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day so basically god tells us brethren to ask and seek and come to him positively and persistently regularly and often to receive the power of his spirit luke chapter 11 verse 5 luke 11 verse 5 has something to tell us in that regard that we need to be you know come to god positively persistently regularly often to receive the power of the spirit and he said to them verse 5 which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him friend lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and i have nothing to set before him and he will answer from within and say do not trouble me the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed i cannot rise and give to you i say to you though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs verse 9 so i say to you this is again telling us brethren so i say to you ask and it will be given to you seek and you'll find knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and he to him who knocks it will be open if a son asks for a bread from any father among you will you give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent instead of a fish or if he asks for an egg will he offer him a scorpion if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your heavenly father give the holy spirit to those who ask him brethren you know a light bulb is useless unless it is in contact with the source of power and so are we jesus set the example for us of getting early in the morning and spending the first part of his day in prayer before anything else could interrupt in mark chapter 1 verse 35 We'll just read it in a moment. And also we'll read in Psalm 5 verse 3 that David also said in that psalm that he prayed early in the morning. Mark 1 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. Now, of course, don't, don't misunderstand me. We live in a different day and age. So, of course, I don't understand. I don't expect you to be rising up that early in the morning. We have a different rhythm of the day. You know, brethren, in those old days, there was no electricity. People would go to bed very early. You know, they would rise in Jerusalem. The, the dawn comes at 6, 6 a.m. You know, the sunset was usually around 6 a.m. So, you know, times were different. Night was very long, and we today live in a very busy day and age and again i'm not advocating that you you know rise up and, and lose your sleep no not at all because i understand how malfunction I, I i i am malfunction i am when i don't get enough sleep so no the point is just that you know if we can get the prayer before we start into our daily routine that's what it is because you know in that way we would just be empowered by god's spirit in psalm 5 verse 3 King David says, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I'll direct it to you and I'll look up. So the you know the point is that our prayer should be priority. Yes, sometimes I understand it, it, it can be a routine that we just fall into routine and this, you know, it becomes stale. Yes, it's true. But, you know, still uh, the point is that we should, you know, dynamically ask God. It doesn't have to be sometimes too long. It doesn't have to be. Uh, to elaborate it's just you know the purpose is that we have god first on mind when we open our eyes and the point is that you know in the morning or some of you have different night shifts perhaps 
you know, in, in, in the case of my cousin Sean, it will be like, you know, it will be in the afternoon. But the first thing that when you open your eyes, that God will come to our minds and the need to connect with that power. That's what it is, because, you know, a light bulb is useless unless it is it is being screwed on to the source of power. So we need to kind of screw the uh, screw our minds onto the power of God. That's the point. That's the purpose. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, in Psalm 55, we're going to read in a minute verses 16 and 17. We have a couple of examples of Daniel and David. They were men entrusted with the highest governmental powers of major kingdoms. In fact, a very busy man. I'll remind you, Daniel was the uh, main librarian at the Babylonian Library, brethren, the Babylonian State Library. And, you know, having having such an access to all the, you know, Babylon would always conquer other countries and then they would take all kinds of liturgies and written materials from those countries. That's, that's how, that is how David was able to uh, study the Bible. It was there at the library and by, you know, by extension, he also participated in the canonization of the Old Testament. Now, how the Bible came to become a book and how it was canonized, it's a very exciting and beautiful story. And uh, God willing, one of these days we're going to go over that. It is amazing how God used various men to preserve his word. And then we have David. You know, David, I'll remind you, he was the king of the United Kingdom of Israel. And under his reign, the Kingdom of Israel was, brethren, something that the Roman, Greco-Roman history, falsified history, has failed to tell us. The Kingdom of Israel, brethren, was one of the world ruling powers. It was allied with Tyre, Tyre with the city of Tyre, and with Phoenicians, and with Sidonians. Uh, the maritime, you know, the, 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 the maritime lines and the, the sea, the kingdom of Israel was a sea power. The American, the North American continent was well known to the ancient kingdom of Israel, brethren. But the Romans and the Greco and Greeks did not know that because, you know, to Gibraltar, from Gibraltar and the Mediterranean was all that they knew. Israelites were smart enough never to tell them that beyond Gibraltar and across the Atlantic Ocean there is a beautiful and marvelous country today known as the United States of America. So those are all very interesting historical facts. You know, history, brethren, the true history is so exciting and so beautiful and so marvelous. And we can be very thankful to an author called Stephen Collins and thankfully here in the library, The Hope of Israel, we do have all the four volumes or the three volumes that is i have one more i guess and so several others i haven't been able to obtain unfortunately but yes we do have some volumes speaking about the truth about the israel israelites at the time of king david and how mighty they were brethren they were a sea power they were one of the world powers so those two the point is the very busy man david had to rule that kingdom and keep it intact daniel was the main librarian so we have the you know very two very busy men who set the example for us of praying three times a day morning noon and night yeah that's even today part of the jewish you might say custom and right but since those examples are written for us in the bible we need to make these examples part of our way of life Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 now when daniel knew that the writing was signed he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. In Psalm 55, verse 16 and 17, As for me, David says, I'll call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I'll pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Now, of course, I realize due to, you know, uh, different routines, daily routines that we have, uh, perhaps praying at noon may not be always an option. But sometimes, you know, we can always kind of, if possible, get secluded into a secluded area and pray, brethren, because praying people are producing people without exception. We must get that prayer in. Nothing is more important. The closer we can stay to God and the often, more often, the less we will sin and the more we will accomplish. 
if we really grab the fact that all we need and want comes from God and our success, failure, happiness, troubles are in direct proportion to the extent to which we commit everything to Him in believing prayer, we will begin to fear to make plans or do anything without seeking His counsel and help. We read in Proverbs 3, let's, let's, let's remind ourselves, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your works acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We do indeed have a, one little sign here up there in the library. Exactly the quote from Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5. Now be instant in prayer. Ask for wisdom before business meetings. You know, brethren, ask for protection before traveling. When you sit in your car, before you start the engine. You know, have a short prayer. Ask God for protection. You know, ask for compassion and patience before going home, tired to your family at night, because some of you work in different, you know, different hours. We need to be producing people without exception. And nothing is more important than prayer. We need to pray always and begin to literally walk and talk with God. You know, remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It says, pray without ceasing. That's a commandment. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Then the next question that arises, brethren, is where should we pray? <laughs> well... You know, when we deeply understand and feel the need to seek God, we will wind up in some awfully funny places. You know, often we must improvise to seek God and show Him we will pray no matter what. Broom closets, lavatories, back seats of automobiles, you know, all have been used. And the important thing is seeing and feeling the urgency of seeking God's help and guidance and power in all we do. Then finding a place to pray is just a matter of course. How to pray? Well, Matthew 6, verse 7, the overall form, you know, for our prayers is in Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Well, brethren, use this outline especially in the longer early morning prayers, perhaps, because usually when we you know, wake up and we realize we're still alive, we, we have this kind of inspiration to pray in the morning. Begin thanking and praising God. You know, God doesn't want, you know, can you imagine somebody coming always with a nagging prayer to you? Oh, give me this. Oh, give me that. Why don't I have this? Why do you, you know, brethren, we need to thank and praise God for life, for our calling, for our family, for home, for his mercy and goodness to us. And it's always good to start prayer like that. To realize the need for God's kingdom and your part in this work. Ask God to help you fulfill his purpose and do his work. Then ask him to help and direct this work, its leaders, and fill its needs, the needs of his people, and your needs, brethren. Yes, the work always has needs, as you know, as we know, all around the world. Ask for forgiveness and beseech God to help you really see yourself, because we don't really see ourselves as we should. Forgive others. Ask for compassion and a spirit of mercy and kindness, patience. Ask God to keep us from temptation, to help us resist Satan, this world ourselves and to make us soft yielded pliable humble so that you know sore trial is not necessary to make us see the need to change ask god to help satan to keep satan that is help us to be kept away from satan but to keep satan and his demons away from this work and from you and to set his angels about those in his work and you and your family then and praising god brethren now realize that God, of course, you can pray for you can pray, and we should pray for the health and for the needs of the others. That's that's that's. Him. I mean, I, I I presume that you are all aware of that. But you know, we can always start our prayers by the best way is by praising and exalting God, brethren, and giving Him thanks. For sometimes, if you stop really and realize how much we have, we have more than all the previous generations of Christians, brethren. We've got so much refined knowledge and understanding. And even in our poor countries, I mean, you know, 
even in those poor countries there are things that are just great blessings regardless of the societal system and corruption or whatever you know in kenya in spite of all the poverty brethren that, that that country is very rich with underground water clean underground water and it's the soil is so preserved because it hasn't been polluted by uh, chemicals it's a great blessing indeed all the people would need to know is just join some hands and dig some wells and uh, sow that seed organic seed and you'll see how it will grow and then keep the seed of course and keep so, you know sowing it over and over again so those who live in kenya should be thankful and grateful for what god has given them Here in my part of the world, I'm surrounded by hills and kind of mountains. I'm very grateful for that. I mean, forgive me those of you who are sea lovers, but I've never been really a big sea lover. I just love to have, you know, solid ground under my feet. And I'm happy with all these hills and, the, you know, the smell of, of sheep and, 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 and the smell of the cows and stuff. I just love this. I love mountains rather than... And I'm thankful that God has put me here. I wanted to live in this part of the world. That was my choice. There was nothing really attractive about this part of the world, you know, this part of Serbia, other than the beautiful nature. You know, the mental frame of people was not that attractive, and uh, uh, they're very staunchly orthodox in their own ways, and they're very kind of stubborn in their own ways. But I myself do enjoy this, and I'm thankful that God has given me this kind of challenge, because, you know, you have to survive, and you have to faith to live in a place like this. And to be very, very honest with you, I feel that I've been rarely so much blessed in my life, like, you know, than now. At least I've achieved something. You know, we have a library, a unique library in all of this continent. We've got books, rare books, and thanks to all of your help as well, we've got some great, wonderful books that I obtained from the U.S. and uh, other places that are just so unique. There is no collection of books like this, and I've never had it, you know, until now. Not to mention that, you know, I've got very kind of thankful landlord, landlady. Not to mention I'm even able to have pets because, you know, when you're a tenant, it's very e not very easy to have them. And sometimes, well, very often the landlords don't want, at least in this country, they don't want you to have any pets. You know, this country is very different from, what, from <laughs> your countries where you live. But I feel very blessed, you know, I, I have all those things now and... Uh, I have a great peace of mind as well among these hills. I'm thankful to God when I open up, you know, my eyes and when I see those mountains and hills, I feel kind of nested in in between and I'm like, yeah, I feel I feel very blessed in that way. So it's very but it's very very easy for all of us. And that's the human nature, brethren, to focus on negative things and to keep grinding and complaining to God about everything and anything, you know. Now Realize that God does know what we need, but He wants to hear us phrase it, and He wants our approach. He wants to hear our approach to that, you know, to it. You know, then realize that God is our Father, and feel it, and and see Him in all His glory and splendor. You know, how do your children come to you with their requests? Those of you who have children, well, they come humbly, openly, expectantly, knowing that you will listen and. If it is good for them and within your power to do, you will grant their request or help them or comfort them. God has the power, brethren, we lack. The compassion we lack. The wisdom we lack. He loves you more than you love your own children. Oh, I know it's very hard for us to fathom that, but that's true. Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. Psalm 103, verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So go to him as his little child. Humbly, openly, expectantly, knowing he will listen and help you. Remember James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And sometimes I remember from Mr. Armstrong's writings that, you know, the effective, fervent prayer was given. Sometimes it was very, that he had a very short time to give a prayer or plea to God for something and God would intervene right away. So fervent believing prayers, you know, they get much accomplished, brethren. Get get up, you know, from your prayers confident and believe that God will act 
and that which you have asked will come to pass. Expect the answer to come. And remember Hebrews 11.6, one of those memory scriptures. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Remember, we covered that, well, those of you who counsel for baptism, we covered that very verse. That was the first verse, actually, that we just basically go into. That was about prayer. Now about fasting, brethren. Why fast? Well, it seems to be a painful topic in the church of God. One that was always avoided. And I was the one ever since I was called. I've been the one who keeps, you know, pointing out again and again and again to people and to myself the need to fast. And every time people come up with all sorts of problems. When I was in Africa, when I was in India and everywhere. In India it wasn't a problem because our brethren there fast twice a month, so collectively. But when I was in Africa and in Europe and other places, when people come up with complaining about certain spiritual stuff, and my question usually to them was, well, what was the last time that you fasted? And sadly, very often in Africa, the uh, answer was never. So why fast, brethren? Well, Jesus Christ commanded and taught his disciples to fast. It is the way to real humility, a close relationship with God, a spiritual and spiritual character and impact. Because, you know, without fasting, we may mentally admit that we are not much, but we do not really comprehend it. We do not really feel it, you know. Being human, as long as you feel strong and healthy, you will by nature tend to trust in yourself and fail to see the necessity of relying totally on God. On God. <coughs> when we fast, we learn how weak, insignificant, useless, worthless we really are. You know, our pride <laughs> quickly crumbles, our self-esteem diminishes, our facade is stripped away, and we realize that all that stands between us and death is one breath. And over a very short period of time, a little food and water. Now reduced to this, you know, we feel and understand the need for God and realize that He truly is our life. Remember Deuteronomy 30. It says, you know, the God sent before us life and death that we were to choose. Deuteronomy 30 verse 20, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So, you know, we feel closer to Him. We feel more humble and yielded and will much more readily obey Him. In short, brethren, fasting regularly is the only way, mark this, is the only way to remain close, dependent, yielded, and responsive to God. With every little success and compliment, you know, and the influence of this society, our family and friends, we tend to drift more and more toward a feeling of self-sufficiency and rely on God's help and guidance less and less. So fasting brings us back to reality, the recognition of our utter uselessness apart from God and His Spirit. Galatians 6.3 simply says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing he deceives himself in the you know in the case of galatians there were those who thought that there was something because they'll be circumcised and yet paul was telling them how useless that ritual is that has nothing to do with salvation and if you want to you know use that ritual law then why don't you just start using all the ritual laws and just convert to judaism and do, you know, all the pharisaical things rather than being free in Christ. How often? Well, I think we, you know, that we have established that, that fasting regularly requires self-discipline and therefore results in the development of stronger char strong character. Now, in this wishy-washy age, brethren, wishy-washy age, you know, men of character and purpose, those willing to sacrifice, oh, I said the word that is not even used anymore in English and other languages. Sacrifice. Those willing to sacrifice and endure hardness are few and far between. Well, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 tells us that you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
And sure enough, we don't really know what Timothy endured because later in, in the church history, we don't find him. We don't find any records of him. So it seems that the Gnostic apostates who infested the early church actually pushed out Timothy and those few faithful pushed them out of their fellowships, brethren. And we can just imagine what hardship Timothy had to endure. Now those who will grow spiritually and be used further by God in his work should fast regularly about once a month on an average. That's what we established sometime when I was in the past and hopefully now we're trying to kind of fast around the new moon so that we'll just also incul inculcate in our minds the need to follow God's calendar. Now of course if you know we're got, if we're going to grow spiritually and be used further by God in his work we should ask regularly, what does happen with those who do not fast at all? Well, you guess. They do not grow spiritually and they will not be used further by God. And finally, meditation. Now, what is meditation? Why meditate? Brethren, meditation is speaking, of course, from a Christian point of view and speaking from the Bible point of view, the true meditation True meditation or Christian meditation has nothing to do with this Eastern Oriental philosophies and practices. Meditation is simply taking a certain theme, problem, scripture, and dwelling on it. You know, asking why, how, when, where, and determining what is the end result. And then determining whether or not that is the result you want. It is a matter of looking at things from God's point of view and is the key to keeping things in their proper perspective. So you can meditate about, say, your job. You can lose it, will you? What steps can you take to ensure your job? Take, for example, Leviticus 26. Remember the pivotal prophecy in the Old Testament, in fact, in all of the Bible. Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 16, has an example. It says, But if you do not obey me, and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I'll even appoint terror over you, Wasting disease and fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, meaning mental disturbances, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Now, do you know what terror is, brethren? Do you, do you want to find out? Now, read the rest of the chapter, so. And dwell on it. Roll it over in your mind. Make it personal. This is God's promise to you if you want change. So do you want it? No, of course not. Now, after meditating and dwelling on it, you see much more graphically the need to change. Without meditation, you can understand the scriptures, but you cannot convict yourself of the need for personal change. And you certainly remember Leviticus 26. What does it say to those who will not obey, brethren? Making it graphic. Yes, I know sometimes people kind of fret when I give very graphic description of the coming trouble of Jacob, the yoke of bondage, the great tribulation. Brethren, but I have to keep warning the, the world, and especially the house of Israel, the modern house of Israel, because that is commanded. Ezekiel's commission, brethren, is upon us, and upon me as an elder, so I have to keep warning the modern house of Israel. However tragic the fall of Israel is, and yes, it, it, it gives me great grief. Still, my commission, commission of us as the church, continuing church of God, commission of all of us is to warn, to warn the world, but especially the modern house of Israel. Because if we don't do it, brethren, I, I feel in the, in the judgment to come, I'll be called to give an account why I refrain from telling the house of Israel, what is coming upon it. 
And especially because, you know, I've spent some time researching the Holocaust and researching the genocide, I have even more responsibility. I have even more responsibility to basically warn the modern Israel. And more responsibility also to tell you, because I live in Europe, and, you know, those of you in North America, you've never had a foreign foot being set on your soils. You've always been free countries. Your national libraries have never been destroyed. Your people have never experienced genocide from a fierce people of fierce countenance, as the Bible calls them. But it's coming. It is coming. It is not pleasant, but somebody has to say that, brethren. I'm not refraining from saying it because it's reality. And I'm telling you this so that you can make it personal as well. That you can, you know, roll that over in your mind. And especially those of you who have also young children, you know, that you're responsible for young children as well. If they're going to make it to the place of safety or not. I've been trying to warn some of these people here in Serbia. Who have been listening to our messages but not really changing their lives. Oh, they're dedicated, you know, to other things that they think they're important. You know, they want to have families and children. And that's wonderful. But they don't realize that, you know, they're not educating their children in the ways of God. If you let your children celebrate birthdays, if you let your children celebrate Christmas and Easter and thinking it's Christian holidays, you're doing them disservice because those are pagan things, for example. And, you know, I have example here in this country that people just have their priorities the other way around. They don't understand that the children are a gift from God. And they have a gift from God that if you want to have really happy children and really happy blessing, it's your responsibility to teach them about the ways of God. But, you know, I've, I've got many people or some people listening to what we are preaching, brethren, but not doing, not doing anything about it. Because they don't see it as a blessing, they see it as a limitation in their lives. And as a result, they're going to suffer. And their children will suffer with them. Now, for those of us who are in the Church of God, we, you know, we always have this choice. And if you have underage children, whatever failure you make, including failure to be supernaturally protected, will affect your children. Who might die from disease just before the Great Tribulation, from hunger, before or during the Great Tribulation, they might die on your arms. So what would you do? And I'm afraid that, you know, living in this Laodicean dominant church age, many church members, and I'm speaking in the broadest sense, I'm speaking about the Church of God in the broadest sense, do not really realize what a horror it would be to stay in the Great Tribulation. And that they might be seeing with their own eyes the death of their own children. And if your own children die before your eyes, you know, what is the chances that you would love to endure to the end? Well, hopefully many will, because then they will think, they will know that they will see their children in the second resurrection. But some brethren may not be able to be mentally so strong and they may just give up on their salvation. That's why I've been, let me explain it now to you very clearly, that is why I've been very open, very graphically describing to you things that are coming up. Because unless we're being mentally ready for that, and if some of us stay behind, if we're not mentally ready, then chances are good, there are good chances that we may just lose our salvation. Now, anyway, do you know what terror is? Do you know, you know, do you want to find out? And among those curses are also eating your own children, you know, horrible things. So, you know, roll, it, roll these things over your mind, brethren. Ezekiel's commission as well. You know, make it personal. Now, this is God's promise to you if you want change. Do you want it? Of course not. You know, the warning in Ezekiel chapter, speaking of Ezekiel's commission, Ezekiel chapter 34. Oh boy, and I think I'll give a message about that as well. About those bad shepherds of Israel, brethren. I make it personal. I make it personal. I fear when I think about those scriptures. Those, you know, shepherds who clothe themselves rather than feeding the flock. That's horrible. God gave us a commission, Ezekiel's commission. And can you imagine, can you imagine being allowed to see like that and clothing yourself? And clothing yourself, by the way, has an implication of, of uh, securing ranks within church hierarchy, by the way. 
It's awful, brethren. But I make it personal. When I think about that scripture, I make it personal. I keep questioning myself all the time. Okay, are you a good shepherd of Israel? Can you be better? Of course you can. You have to be better. So after meditating and dwelling on, you know, on it, you should see much more graphically the need to change. Without meditation, brethren, you, you can understand the scriptures, but you cannot convict yourself of the need for personal change. Now, how to meditate? It's also a good question. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26. Ponder your course of action, your way of life. Consider the end. Look before you leap. You know, the book of Proverbs is a ready-made ready -made key to meditation. Proverbs 4, 26. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Now, these are the conclusions of Solomon through meditation. Read them and reverse the process, brethren. Read the conclusion and then go back and fill in the thinking and meditation. Psalm 1, the psalm we all very, very well know. I have a hymn. It says, verse 1, Blessed is the man who savors and loves God's law because it is good and right and who meditates on it day and night. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2, but has delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of waters, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. But unlike the chaff which the wind drives away, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Well, brethren, the ungodly do not meditate and are not grounded and rooted in God's word, but they are shallow like chaff. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. God commands us to meditate on his law day and night in order that we might you know obey and do those commandments joshua 1 8 it says about the book the book of the law the one that we're going to read in a couple of weeks the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now, the place to begin is, of course, with the Ten Commandments. Let's take number seven, for example. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why not? You know, isn't it enjoyable? Yes. Even Hebrews 11.25 says sin is pleasurable for a season. It says, choosing rather to suffer, Moses choosing, was choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Because Egypt was that, you know, symbol of sin, brethren. But then what? Well, read Proverbs 6, 2 Samuel 13, Genesis 34 and Revelation 21. We're going to read that in a minute. Certain verses out of those scriptures. And you'll find out that the immediate result may be death at the hands of her irate husband, your reputation ruined and a nagging guilty conscience. Later may come a venerable disease or a pregnancy further complicating matters. Remember how David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Your own wife or husband you know, finds out and is heartbroken and your once happy marriage at home is a shambles your wife or husband and children no longer can look up to you or trust you you are destined to carry this scar for the rest of your life proverbs 6 23 and especially you younger children listen to this you young men listen to this and you parents read them this proverbs without any shame tell them and warn them Verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep you from 
Listen, you young man, to keep you from the evil women, woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. Verse 26. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. Now, yes, young men, we do understand sexual, sexual drive. It's God-given gift not to be misused with harlots. It's a God-given gift to be enjoyed in a right marriage. And an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Listen, young man. Verse 27. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on the hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Verse 30. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet, when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. That was the Old Testament law, by the way. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. Whoever commits, verse 32, adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Did you hear that, young man? And you teenagers, you want to destroy your soul? Just get involved. You just need to get involved with adultery and fornication, pornography, and it's going to destroy your soul. And bring terrible mental anguish that you do not want. And we younger, we older ones are telling you this from our experiences. We're not telling you something that is just a theory. Before we were converted and called by God, our souls were destroyed with all these wrong uses of sex. Okay, And there is no shame to speak about that. We have to tell you and warn you about that, young people. Verse 33. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Young men, Proverbs 6, 23 through 35, we have just read. Mark that, type it out, keep it in your mind burning. If not, you're going to destroy your soul. And wrong sexual habits are very nasty and they're very hard to break. And yes, we older people can tell you that again from our own experiences. And the least that we want you young people to suffer is to go the wrong ways and practice the wrong ways that we sadly practice because there was nobody in many cases nobody to tell us how wrong it will be and how much we were going to destroy our souls second samuel chapter 13 verse 14 and 15 however he would not heed her voice and being stronger than she he forced her and lay with her this is talking about again misuse of sex we're talking about one of david's sons forcing himself on his half-sister. Verse 15, And Ammon hated her exceedingly, you see. He was withering away to have sexual relations with her, and then, after having done that, she became disgusting to him. Well, that's what happens when you misuse sex. Hated her exceedingly so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Ammon said to her, Arise, be gone. Verse 22, And Absalom spoke to his brother Ammon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Ammon because he had forced his sister Tamar. In Genesis 34, we have the, Israel, the uh, sons of Jacob. Verse 7, Genesis 34, And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, because their sister was abused. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying, lay, laying, that is, with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. And the result, 
go and read them in Genesis 34. Young people, take this into your mind. And if you have any question about sex, come and ask us. We'll give you the answer which is based on God's word. If you have any question, any doubt, whatever, that might you know, trouble you, come and ask us. But do not go in the wrong ways. Because in this day and age, it's only a click away, and there you go. And there you set your feet on the destruction, on the way to destruction of your souls. You do not want that. Because the mental anguish and the pain is far greater than any passing pleasure you will have in those wrong ways. We don't want you to see the same suffering and mental anguish. And again, for your own sake, I'll keep repeating these warnings to you, young people. Again and again. I cannot, of course, prevent you from making wrong choice, if, you, if that's what you'll determine to do. But at least, my conscience before God will be at peace that I warn you in time. And to you parents as well. We're not Catholics, and we're not to be ashamed of something that is part of what God created in us. And again, if you have, if you feel still shame and you feel uneasy, okay. Let your children ask the others of us. We will just, you know, tell them about the mental language and we'll try to encourage them not to make the wrong choices. But we must not, brethren, let this world educate our children about matters as important as sexual relationships. We must not let the world do it because so often we have done it. Why? Because we feel ashamed. Ashamed of what? Of the purpose of God? The purpose of sex is, you know, that God is reproducing Himself. What is shameful about that? God is family. Revelation 21.8 But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderer, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars shall... Be have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So young people and the rest, you know, you contemplate. contemplate. Yeah, we're talking about the adultery, but, you know, the, the same end is for the fornication. Those who are, sex, you know, misusing sex outside of marriage anyway, not being married. Adultery is, you know, cheating on your mate, but uh, fornication is another type of sexual immorality. Nevertheless, the result, the end result is still the same. So when you ponder all of this, then what? Well, if not repented of deeply and bitterly, if somebody commits adultery and such things, you wind up in the lake of fire. And we are, you know, we are thinking now about all these things that we have read, and you simply ask, we're meditating on those, on the seventh commandment. You simply ask yourself, after savoring it all, thinking it all out, pondering it, is it worth it for a few minutes excitement ghastly no then you think further trembling by this time where does it begin and how can i avoid it at all costs well matthew five twenty eight says but i say to you jesus christ tells us that whoever looks at a woman or a man to lust for her or him has already committed adultery with her in his heart well christ says it begins with <laughs> playboy magazine or a sexy movie or various clips on YouTube, or looking too long at the girl in the office with a short skirt and taking a second to let your mind wander. Young men, keep in mind all that because Satan will play on those emotions if you let him. Further, Jesus Christ tells us, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, to flee fornication and anything that even looks tempting. So don't play around. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And by this time, as we meditate on that, you're in full agreement and you're ready to pray fervently for God's help to keep the seventh commandment. Because we have, you know, you meditate and then you analyze and you ponder and you delve into it and you think, oh, the consequences are terrible. 
you know, the the final consequence would be the lake of fire. But before that, the mental anguish and pain and suffering is just horrible. And being caught up in a vicious circle of, 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 of those sexual sins, it's so destructive. Destructing. That's why young people you have unhappy marriages. That's why you have broken homes. That's why many of your peers are without one parent. That's why, etc., etc. Is that how you want your life to be? I hope not. And we, older ones, will try to protect you as much as you allow us to. Try to protect your minds and encourage you to make the right choices. But Satan will keep attacking you. Keep that in mind. The ultimate choice is yours. Satan will not relent. And we all well know that. You younger ones may not really know that because, you know, you're now being influenced by hormones and, you know, you, you, exciting things. But, yes, it's all exciting. Always properly used will be even more exciting beyond, beyond your imagination. But being misused, Satan will just use it to destroy your own souls. So, you know, as you contemplate and meditate those things, you know, by this time we are in full agreement with the Seventh Commandment, but we need to review it in our minds from time to time, lest it slip, because as I said, there is nothing, whatever is spiritual is not lasting in our physical mind. Hebrews 2 1 says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And for everyone, it's not in vain that I've given a message about apostasy, lest we drift away. And I think I'll give a message about drifting away as well. How do we drift away? And uh, I haven't said yet everything I have in mind about the apostasy, but we need to have to must to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. And today I downloaded a nice nice poster saying it's time for God's people to stop speaking and listen to what God has to tell say. Things we have heard, things that we'll hear repeatedly, brethren, many people did listen to those things, the same things in the times past in the WCG days they heard about the place of safety they heard about the importance of keeping the seventh commandment they heard about the danger of being involved in pagan holidays etc etc they listened some of them for decades and yet they drifted away that's why we need to remind ourselves review what we have convicted ourselves by our meditation lest we let it slip and lest we just drift away. Now, when to meditate? That's a good question. And again, it's a matter of personal choice. In Genesis 24, we do have one example, verse 63, that Isaac was meditating in the evening. He says, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Now, I can understand Isaac because I live in an urban area, and... Uh, when I go out to the balcony, especially late at night, and it's all peaceful and quiet, <laughs> other than one of my neighbors across one of my neighbors across the street, he sometimes comes out and lights a cigarette because he smokes outside, <laughs> not inside at home. But you can only hear that click of the lighter, so that's the only thing that uh, you can hear in this wonderful night silence. And of course, we may just wave to one another, but in any case. There is usually peace, great peace out there in the streets. And, you know, if you go out to a balcony here, yeah, you can kind of give your mind over to some meditation and uh, contemplation. So, you know, for Jacob, for Isaac, that is, it was the best at night. Why is that the best time? Well, because you all know the pressure of the day is over and you're in a reflective mood. You reflect on all that happened throughout the day. But don't just daydream and let your mind wander. You know, meditate on a definite theme in conjunction with God's word and law or a personal problem or situation in your life. And brethren, you will be amazed at the results and the changes you make in your life. Well, so we realized there was need for some practical Christian living messages. I hope that these points about prayer, fasting and meditation will 
indeed help you in your further Christian walk.